The outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic has brought about a strange, unsettling time for us all, almost a twilight zone kind of experience. It feels a little surreal. It's so easy for most of us in our society to take so much for granted and even perhaps to be like Israel in today's reading from Exodus, grumbling at God, angry, asking, is the Lord with us or not? Forgetting that God has walked with us all along, showering us with blessings. The coronavirus pandemic has upset our world, disturbed our routines, and even made us feel somewhat threatened. This is a good time to remember the words of the psalmist. God is our refuge and strength, our very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be moved, though the mountains be toppled into the depths of the sea. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. I believe that with all my heart, and I'm confident you believe it too. We've all been asked to engage in what has been euphemistically called social distancing. We're being asked to self-isolate as much as possible, to avoid person-to-person -person physical contact. It's a big ask. Human beings are by nature social. We require contact and person-to-person -person relationships. But of course, social distancing is nothing new. Today's gospel reading hints at another form of social distancing, perhaps ostracization. It involves a woman, a Samaritan woman. It's a pretty unusual story. What's unusual? Lots. To begin with, Jesus is talking to a woman. There's something remarkable about her. The encounter between Jesus and the woman at the well is in broad daylight at noontime and she's alone. Some have suggested that this woman was alone because she was disreputable, that her reputation as the wife of five husbands was so bad that she had to get her water at high noon, the hottest part of the day, because she was ostracized by the other women of the, villages, of the village who would regularly get their water early in the morning when it was cool out. That sounds like a reasonable argument to me. But here, Jesus shows up. And Jesus does what Jesus so often does. He breaks boundaries. He cuts through any social distancing. Jesus speaks to the woman. In Jesus' time and place, that's just not done. But there's more. The woman is also a Samaritan. Jesus is a Jew. More social distancing. As the text makes clear, Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Why does Jesus speak with her? Well, says he's tired. He's tired and thirsty. He says to her, give me a drink. Now, this woman knows what the normal code of behavior is, and so she challenges Jesus. How, it, how is it that you, a Jew, ask of me, a woman of Samaria, a drink? She tries to uphold the social norms and social distancing. Jesus responds, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Huh? Where's that come from? This happens a lot in John's gospel. Jesus is asked a direct question. He responds with an answer that takes things to a different level. She pushes the question in the conversation. She's even a little bit sassy. But she also seems curious, especially about this living water. Sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty the water that I will give them will become in them a spring of living water gushing up to eternal life. In the Bible, living water, running water, is often symbolic of salvation. For us, it's also the symbol of baptism. You can be sure John wants us to make this connection. The Samaritan woman is still trying to understand, however. Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. She's still at the literal level. Jesus perceives he's getting nowhere with this conversation and tells her to call her husband. I have no husband, she responds. 
you are right in saying I have no husband for you've had five husbands and the one you have now is not your husband. What you've said is true. Biblical scholar N.T. Wright observes about this exchange. Jesus saw straight to the heart of what was going on. The woman has had a life composed of one emotional upheaval after another with enough husbands coming and going to keep all the gossips in the village chatting for weeks. But Wright observes, she knew her life was a mess and she knew that Jesus knew. She tries to change the subject. Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you say the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jacob's well, where they're talking, is in Sikar, and the Samaritans had built their own temple on nearby Mount Gerizim, which was to be their alternative to the Jerusalem temple. In the setting in which John places the exchange between Jesus and the woman, the two of them would have been able to see Mount Gerizim, although by this time, John, by the time John's gospel was written, both the Samaritan place of worship and the Jewish place of worship would have been destroyed. This helps underscore the importance of the next thing Jesus says to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship God neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. The hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for such the Father seeks to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Spirit and water, rebirth and salvation. It is clear. John is teaching us about baptism and the salvation of God on desire and the power of God to call people into new life through Jesus, to turn lives around, even a person's life as much of a mess as this Samaritan woman's life is. I know the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus responds to her, I am he, the one speaking to you. It is the first of the so-called I am sayings in John's gospel. These echo the revelation of God to Moses at the burning bush. Who shall I say sent me, Moses asked in Exodus. And the voice from the burning bush, the voice of God responds, tell them I am has sent you. In Hebrew, this is translated something like Yahweh. It is the proper and sacred name of God, a name so revered by Jews that they never speak it aloud. I am he, Jesus says to the woman. And what does the woman do with this revelation? How does she respond? Well, Jesus' disciples show up. They're a little shocked that he's talking to a woman, a Samaritan woman at that. They don't question him about this, but they are puzzled and likely troubled. <clears throat> but she uses their interruption as an excuse to make a timely escape. And she rushes back to the village and calls out to anyone who will listen. Come and see a man who told me everything I had ever done. Excitement often results in exaggeration, doesn't it? He cannot be the Messiah, can he? This woman of questionable reputation, this woman who has held her own in a conversation with Jesus, who has continually helped take the conversation to a higher level, becomes a messenger of the gospel to her village. She calls out to everyone who will listen. And we're told that many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. They came out to him and asked him to stay with them. And we're told that he did stay with them for two days and that many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the savior of the world. That seems an unfortunate put down of the woman. Still, it's an incredible gospel message about the extent of Jesus saving power. In Jesus Christ, God cuts through all social distancing, inviting all people to new and richer life, no matter who we are, no matter where we are, no matter what we've done. It's the third Sunday in Lent. We are self-isolating because of the coronavirus. What an opportune time to allow ourselves to be encountered by Jesus anew, to imagine ourselves at the well, like that Samaritan woman. In this Lenten time of self-examination and renewal, when we have been forced to fast from church and from our usual celebrations of Eucharist, perhaps here is space for us in solitude to realize that Jesus sees right through us, sees it all, knows everything about us, knows everything we've ever done, and that through it all, Jesus loves us anyway. Lent is a time to discover that we're not to be defined by those elements of our lives about which we are ashamed. It's not that they're not real. It's not that they haven't happened. It's not even that they're not sinful. 
they likely are. And if we're still living in these things that make us ashamed, then it's a time to renounce them. It's a time to allow God's grace in Christ to give us strength to stop them so that we can move on in life. In fact, that's the point. Lent is a season when we are made new. It is a period when we are to engage in what the 12-step community refers to as a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves, but also a time when we are entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character, again, in the words of the 12-step community, to humbly ask God to remove our shortcomings and also when we are called to make amends to those we may have harmed or may be harming. It is a liberating thing to engage in this cleansing encounter with Christ and with ourselves. It has the potential to make all things new. It has the potential to give us new life. In short, it has the power of Easter. It is Lent. Come and see this person, Jesus, really see him. Let him meet you at the well. Let him break through all that social distancing. Jesus, who knows everything you have done, experience his love and let him make you new. He is indeed the savior of the world. And isn't that just what our world needs right now? And isn't that just what our world needs right now?